Alrighty. Let's go before the Lord and ask Him to bless our time of study. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the book of Revelation and um, the time that you have prepared for us to be able to dig into your word. And as we have gone through such, in such deep chapters, I pray that you would guide us in, um, in, in what this means for us. What can we be aware of? What can be, we be warned of? And what can we learn more about you? And so as we make our way through chapter 14, 15, and 16 tonight, I pray that you would guide us. Be our, um, be our lead guide through this time, Holy Spirit. Pray your blessing on this fellowship. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we are uh, making our way through the book of Revelation. And we're doing it in an interesting light, right? We're um, focusing on what does this, what does this unveil or teach us or reveal to us about Jesus? And, you know, after last week's study, I think that's sometimes an important thing to almost come back to and make sure that we realize. I think that last week was... Uh, those two of the darkest chapters, I think, in the whole Bible. You know, when you talk about what we witnessed in this middle of the tribulation period and just the awful things that take place, you know, when the Antichrist reveals himself and demands worship and Israel being persecuted and having to flee. And um, I, I, my thought on the week is, like, do you ever watch a movie like Schindler's List? And you just go like, you almost feel sick to your stomach after you watch it. And you just go, man, I, I can't believe that that was so dark and awful and how people were treated. And that's the way that I feel with Revelation 12 and 13 is that, boy, what a, what a difficult thing when these Satan review, you know, comes out and has these two beasts with him. And they form this terrible trio and they make everybody bow down and worship them and. Um, the persecution that comes along with it. And so, you know, I know that it, it, the last two chapters were difficult. But the neat thing is, is that we totally switch into chapter 14. Chapter 14, 15, and 16 have a much different feel to them. Um, I will tell you that if you're uncomfortable with fire and brimstone preaching... Today may make you squirm a little because this is where we actually talk about fire and brimstone. Um, the, the judgment and the wrath of God is now being poured out. And so we're in a much different place than we were last week where God is now going to deal with the world and all of the sin that it has committed over the course of human history. And so the feel is going to be much different um, if I could say there's going to be a big emphasis, it would be the voices, the praise, and the proclamations that we'll see. We're just going to see different things being cried out and proclaimed and worshipped. And so this chapter will, will take a much different turn than the last two chapters. And so let's make our way to chapter 14. And you'll see what I mean in verse 1. Revelation chapter 14. Remember, we are, we've just gone through the middle, the middle of the tribulation period. And now we are, we're, we're kind of picking up. And it says, And then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 142,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. Now let's pause right there for a minute. I, I don't know that you could come up with any more of an opposite chapter, an opposite scene of where we were last week. Right? Last week we had this beast that... Um, they came up, had this number 666 with him, and was making everybody bow down and worship him. It was a forced type of a thing. And now, we totally switch, and it says that the Lamb is standing, Jesus, is standing on Mount Zion with the 144,000, having his Father's name written on their foreheads. So, so this is very interesting. Um... Last week, the Antichrist was persecuting Israel and devouring anyone that had given allegiance to Jesus. And he made people put marks on their bodies. Now, isn't that just how Satan works? That God was eventually going to put his mark on this group of people. And Satan comes in and works through this beast to make people get a mark on their skin. And isn't that how he does things, right? He's always trying to be a copycat. Always wanted to be like God. <clears throat> 
Satan is an imitator, and he always is trying to imitate God. So you may ask, okay, where is this? Mount Zion. What, what, what is going on here? Mount Zion is a, um, it's a very talked about place throughout Scripture. It's typically, it is being referred to as Jerusalem. Okay, and, and let me just give you a couple verses to, to kind of help us understand how the Lord feels about Zion or has talked about it all throughout the Old Testament. But here's just a few. Joel chapter 3, verse 17. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. So Jerusalem will be holy, and strangers will pass through it no more. Isaiah 52, 1 and 2. Awake, awake, clothe yourself in the strength, O Zion. Clothe, your, clothe yourselves in the beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. Micah 4, 6 through 8. In that day, declares the Lord, I will assemble the lame and gather the outcast, even those who I, am, I have afflicted. I will make the lame a remnant, and the outcast a strong nation, and the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion. From now on and forever. As for you, tower of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion, to you it will come. Even the former dominion will come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. Isaiah 46 and 13, it says, I bring my righteousness, it is not far off, and my salvation will not delay, and I will grant salvation in Zion, in my glory for Israel. I got just a couple more. Listen to what he says in Isaiah 62. For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her righteousness goes forth as brightness. As her salvation as a lamp that burns, the Gentiles shall see your righteousness and all the kings of your glory. You shall be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will name. Then skip down to verses 11 and 12. It says, Indeed, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the world, say to the daughter of Zion, Surely your salvation is coming. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before them. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And you shall be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. So we see that Zion is often referred to interchangeably with Jerusalem. It's, it could also be encompassing of all of Israel. And so you, know, you, you, you read verse 1 and you say, so we're in Jerusalem with Jesus. Well, that's definitely one thought. So it brings up many questions, right? Well, when in the world is this happening? Because if Jesus is on earth, that means that he has returned. And there's kind of two, I guess, big ways of thinking is, number one, some believe that this is a scene in heaven. Now, there's some interesting difficulties with that, right? Because if the 144,000 that we're talking about here have been sealed, that means that they're protected, which means they wouldn't be in heaven. Now, it could very well mean that this is John looking at a further time that is not in chronological order, which I think makes the most sense. You know, when you're, as a, as a pastor, I understand when we read some difficult scripture, sometimes it's good to take a step back and talk about hope. And last week, you know, as John is writing this, I would imagine that he's thinking, oh my goodness, guys, it, it will get better. And so it very well could be that... It, he is now seeing a vision at the end of the tribulation period when the saints are gathered together and Israel is now proclaiming Jesus as Lord. It also could be that this is happening in chronological order. But then also that brings up some questions. Is this the second coming of Jesus? Well, I guess either way you're going to have questions to deal with. I think that it's a neat scene that John is now seeing the victory and the proclamation of this 144,000. So then it says in verse 2, And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder, and I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. I'm going to pause right there for a minute because some of you get worried that we're going to be in heaven just playing harps all day. Well, you know, my mom is a big time harp player. And this is one of, sometimes people hate this verse, but my mom would absolutely dig it. I will also share that if you look up the word harp, sometimes it can mean a guitar. 
So it could very well be that they're, you know, shredding on a guitar or a harp. But we definitely know at this point there are musical instruments that they are using to worship. Let's keep going in verse 3. And it says, And they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are those who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They were redeemed. They were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and the Lamb. In their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. What a description of this 144,000. And we've talked about them before, but here we see them again. And we're given a good description of what they will look like. It says they sang a, they sang a song before the throne. Again, is this heaven? Is this earth? I'm not exactly sure. I called up a pastor that I've been asking all my revelation questions to. And I asked him that question. He goes, Ben, I don't, I don't know. And I said, I seem to keep asking the questions that nobody has answers to. But we know that it's a new song, which is kind of neat. Psalm 96.1 says that we are to sing a new song to the Lord. And this sure will be one. I think it's a neat thing. I know as I've asked Ruby to continuously sing the book of Revelation, I bet she loves this verse. There's going to be a new song saying. One of the things that I take from this section is, this isn't going to be our song. And that's okay. I, I, in a polite way, I think that we have got to stop trying to take things that aren't, our, that aren't ours. This is going to be for the 144,000, and it is going to be a worship song that they can sing. I think it's neat to think about a time when Israel as a nation will accept Jesus. I hope as a Christian that we are yearning for our our Jewish brothers and sisters to be coming to that point. To when they will look on at Jesus and say, He is the Messiah. And this little section is proof of that. And so instead of us going, hey, is this the church or is this the Jehovah's Witnesses? I think that it's, it's enjoyable and encouraging to look on and say, no. This is a very special group. This is the 144,000 that represent the 12 tribes. And this is Israel now embracing and accepting Jesus. And that's something that I think that we should be pumped up about. You know, when you read through the scriptures and you go from Genesis all the way to Revelation, one of the things that as you go into the New Testament, you can almost feel this excitement for the nation of Israel to finally have their Messiah. And it's heartbreaking that they rejected him. And it almost is like, man, this story is not complete. As you go through Jesus' ministry, and as they reject him at the end, you go, no. The whole biblical story was that they were to accept him and that they would be the ones that would take the gospel around the world. But it didn't go that way. He decided to to create this thing called the church, and he brought Gentiles in to go and, and spread the gospel. But there is a time where everything will be restored. I love what it says in verse 4. These are the ones who are not defiled by women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They were redeemed from among men. Guys, God is a God of restoration. He loves it. He is in the ministry of restoring relationships. You know, when you think about me and I, you know, whenever I hear that, there's sometimes that I think there are some relationships that I don't think I'll ever see restored on this side of heaven. And, you know, if you were to think about or ask the Lord, what is the toughest relationship for him to restore? I think Israel would probably be number one, right? You couldn't have it go any worse than it did. He basically had this couple thousand year period of producing a nation that would bring forth the Messiah and right when it came down for them to shine they said "Ah, we don't believe you this is like the most heartbreaking story ever and we're in this church age now where the Jewish people have been set aside and been kind of put in time out and the Gentiles are now in this era of the church but what is so cool is that we have the hope of looking on and going 
there will come a time where God will redeem this relationship. And to me, that's encouraging. Because my little relationships that are broken, they still have hope. And so do yours. So again, this is a song of redemption and one that only Israel can sing. And I think we should be pumped up about it. Now it also says something interesting here about this group of 144,000. It says that they're virgins. They're not defiled by women. You say, well Ben, is that a bad thing to be married? No, it's not a bad thing. It's just that this group, once the tribulation hit, they had other things that they were doing. And it kind of reminds me of, of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 when he said, For I wish that all men were even as I myself, but each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them to remain as I am. And so Paul was a guy that was too busy to get married. He says, I got I got, I got Church is the plan. I got letters to write. I can't be, I can't be, and that, that's the way that it happens, right? We get married and things start coming into place where you can't go and do, you know, ministry maybe as you would when you were single. And so this group, I'm not saying that it's a bad thing to be married. It's just they've looked on and said, we've, we've got other things to do right now. It also gives you an, an interesting question when people claim to be the 144,000, right? Are you married? Oh, yeah. Hmm. It's interesting. Right? There's, there's questions that we can ask. I don't know if you'd really want to ask all these questions, but we know that there are specific things about this group that you have to be to be in that group. You've got to be in the nation of Israel, and it also talks about what, you, what their purity looks like. And so we get to see a little bit more about this group. So now let's go on to another vision. Most likely back to earth in the time of the tribulation. And these are the seven proclamations before the wrath of God is poured out. It says, verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth and the sea and springs of water. Let's pause right there for a minute. So you say, okay, there's, a, there's, an, there's now an angel flying around proclaiming the gospel. What is this? What is the symbol of this? What does this mean? I think it's a literal angel literally flying around preaching the gospel. I've looked at all kinds of different responses and that's the only one that totally makes sense. And I think it's going to be epic. To every nation, every tribe, every tongue, and every people. Who's the gospel for? It's for everybody. Everybody is welcome into heaven. The one prerequisite to get in is you've got to give your life to Jesus. But everybody is welcome. I love how it says here, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to Him. Now if you think about it, think about how merciful of a God we have. Even at the very last instant, before this judgment is going to come, God is still saying, repent, 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 repent. What a God that we serve that is so merciful. He says, fear God, give glory to Him. I don't think that anybody will be able to say when they come before the judgment seat, I wasn't warned. We're all given warnings. Hey, come with me to church. Hey, have you ever given your life to Jesus? Hey, Jesus loves you. You even get to the point where these folks are going to have an angel flying around proclaiming, get right with the Lord, fear God. So the first proclamation is, fear God and give Him glory. Let's go on to verse 8. It says that another angel followed saying, Babylon is fallen. It is fallen, the great city, because she has made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So Babylon is fallen. We will read more about Babylon next week. Babylon is represented in a bunch of different ways, and we'll cover that in chapter 17. But the second proclamation is, 
Babylon, city of sin, has fallen. Verse 9, it says, Then an angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest, day or night, who worship the beast and his image. And whoever receives the mark of his name, here is the patient, the patience of the saints here, and those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The, the third proclamation is a warning. Do not worship the beast. And there's a clear warning here. Don't do it. Don't take this mark. And what we had talked about last week was that it'd be almost impossible not to. This roller that had hit the scene, he created this system where if they were to buy and to trade, they would have to have this mark on them. So this angel is saying, don't do it. If you do it, you've gone too far. And there's going to be no turning back. The consequence is, is given now it's interesting that fire and brimstone is typically looked at such a terrible light, right? You know, typically, oh, that guy, he's a, he's a preacher of fire and brimstone. It's God's description of punishment. It's being real. You can't paint this in a nice, comfortable light. You would understand why a lot of, a lot of people wouldn't want to read this. But this is the truth. You, you, you can't get away from this. There's an everlasting fire and brimstone that is waiting. It says, He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. This is going to be awful. It is so awful that even when Jesus was comparing this to what he was going to have to do, he said to his father, If it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Remember, Jesus drank our wrath. This cup of wrath that is being talked about here. He drank it. And he took the full blow of sin and Satan's curse on us. The cup did not pass from Jesus. And it will not pass from this group. Brimstone in the presence of a holy angel. In the presence of the Lamb. Now this is a very interesting section here. Because it shows that you won't get away from God. Some people believe that hell is just separation from God. It's not true. Look at what we read here. In the presence of, of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Hell is not just the separation from God. Hell is also torment. It's going to be awful. It's going to be terrible. And so we see what the dynamics will look like here. It says, And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. There's no end to this torment. When you think about that, that's really quite interesting. I believe that there are millions, in fact, probably billions of people that right now are dangling over the fire and the brimstone of eternal hell right now. And if God were to just pull His hand out, which He's protecting us from it, and all of those that haven't given their lives to Him, He's protecting them. Everybody is just dangling on this great and mighty hand. And it's mercy. You know, when all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, we know that the, the, the punishment of sin is death. And so everybody that has sinned is, is it, we, would be welcome. It would be just for them to be into this fire. But God is right now keeping it back and holding all of those that haven't given their lives to Him. Holding them up, giving them shot after shot after shot after shot. But there comes a time in your life where your number is called. And... It's taken out from under you. And there's going to come a time for everybody at here where God says, that's it. Enough is enough. It is now time for us to deal with this. And isn't that a wake-up call? You, you can't fool God. You can't be thinking in, on one side, hey, I live a good life. Good life isn't good enough. And so we can't fool around with this. We can't say, hey, tomorrow I'll get right with the Lord. Tomorrow I'll make things better. But you got to get right now because tomorrow isn't promised. 
Let's go to verse 13. It says, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works. Follow them. The fourth proclamation is blessing to those who are dead in Christ. The fifth proclamation is rewards for labor for the Lord. Those are two really good proclamations, I think. It says, verse 14, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And on the cloud sat one, like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Yikes. First question you might ask in this section is, who, who, who are we talking about? You know, in my Bible it says the one and the O in one is capitalized. So they've made the guess that this is Jesus. And that would make sense. A couple of people that say this couldn't be Jesus because number one, um, this angel is telling the, this one what to do. Is Jesus going to be taking orders? Well, it could just very well be that this other angel says, listen, it's time. And he's kind of ushering in what's happening. It says that, that this one had on his head a golden crown. Sure does sound like Jesus. So very well could be Jesus, could be another angel, not exactly sure. It says, for this time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Now the harvest of wrath being ripe is a scary thing. There's going to come a point, you know, we, uh, for, for those of you that are now planting gardens in your backyard... And I would call us farmers instead of gardeners because that's what we are here in Ohio. There comes a time where you do all this work in the spring and you plant and you pick all the worms off of your, you know, when your kale comes up and you're trying to make sure that all your plants are healthy and you're on your hands and knees looking and inspecting and trying to get all these bugs off. And then you come out the next day and you have something else to deal with. And, you, you know, you work with this and you try to make sure your dirt is right. And if it isn't watered, you take your hose out there and, you, you know, you're just like an eight month process and there comes this incredible time at the end of the gardening or the farming season when you get to harvest and it's the best because your apples are ripe right and your kale is all bunched out and the lettuce is you, you know you just oh man we're gonna have salads for days and your cucumbers are huge and they started out like this and now they're you know strung all over the place and you go this is it it's time to feast we will eat tonight. You know, you go out and you, you take a big old bowl and the kids fill it all up and you come in and it's, it's, it's harvest time. Now you can't do that when your stuff isn't ripe because it tastes terrible. Apples that aren't ripe aren't very good. Kale that isn't ripe tastes terrible. But there comes a time where everything is ready. Isn't it interesting that he's using that illustration when it comes to a sinful world? That means that there is going to come a time where the world is so sinful that God looks on and goes, it's ripe. And isn't it wild that we look around at our world right now and you hear about kidnapping and kidnapping of kids and the murder of kids and you go, how much more ripe could we get? Because I look around right now and I go, it, we're harvest time, right? It sure does look like we're close. So the sixth proclamation is judgment pronounced. Reap the earth. It's ready. It's ripe. Verse 17. It says, Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. Now sickle is a farming tool. It's a, um, you know, the grim reaper is kind of what you would think of. That's a, a sickle, right? And they would, uh, that's the way that they would get their wheat. So a, you know, that's kind of the tool we're looking at here. Then an angel came out of the temple, which is heaven. He also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came from the altar, who had the power over fire. And he cried with a loud cry, 
to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the wine wine press was trampled outside the city. The blood came out of the wine press and the horses bridles for one hundred or one thousand six hundred furlongs. All right, let's pause right there for a minute. First, you remember the the martyrs, the martyred saints cried out and asked God when judgment would come. Well, here it is. Here it is. If you've ever wondered, Lord, you've had something happen to a family member. Or you see somebody that is killed for a terrible reason and you just go, when is justice going to come? Now I'm not talking about our justice system in America, right? Because it's, sometimes it can really make you frustrated. Everybody is going to have to account for the things that they've done. And there is going to come a time where God is going to say it is, it's time for judgment. And so you understand the heart of the martyrs. Oh my goodness, when is judgment going to come? Well, here it is. Second, I want to give a couple nuggets here by Pastor David Guzik. I, I loved what he had to say about this section. He brought up a really, a really neat thing. He said, uh, listen to what he says here. <clears throat> he says, the great wine press of the wrath of God. He said, this vivid picture of judgment was the inspiration for the battle hymn of the Republic. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vineyard where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Isn't that crazy? Battle him of the Republic was looking forward to this time. His next nugget that he that he shared. Is looking at how these images are used in similar ways in scripture. The sickle being used for harvesting. Harvesting was an interesting image. We would typically look at it in a positive light. But here we see a different understanding of this harvest of wrath. And it's talked about a little bit in Matthew 13, 24 through 30. Jesus outlined this interesting dynamic that God does with a harvest. One that I think that sometimes we can read and get frustrated with. Let me read it to you. In verse 24, it's this parable it says, in another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in the field. But while the man slept, his enemy came, and he sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had been sprouted and produced a crop, the tares also appeared. So the servants and the owner came and said to him, Sir, do you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us to go and gather them up? But he said, No. Lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. See, God has very interesting patience or long-suffering, doesn't he? That he would look on at what's happening even within the church. And there's some wheat and there's some tares. And at times you look on and go, why didn't God pull that awful person out of that fellowship? Or as being the pastor of that church. You hear about pastors falling and having stolen money or having an affair with somebody within the fellowship. And you go, God, why did you let him pastor that church for 20 years? Why didn't you just tear him, pull him up? He has long suffering like we don't understand. He looks on and he says, well, if I pulled at that point, it could have pulled out others. And he has this way of letting us grow together. But at the end, notice the terrors will be dealt with. At the end, when it's harvest time, he will take one and put them in a pile and put them into the barn. He'll take the other, put them in a pile and burn them. This is the time... When they're being put into these bundles. Justice will come. God will deal with everything that has happened. And this is proof of it. So the last proclamation is that God is gathering the wicked. And what a sight. 
What judgment? What wrath? Get out of the way. Guys, I know that this happens all across fellowships. Not only in our community and in our country, but in, in the world. We know that there is terrors among we. Everybody has to get right with the Lord. And we can't always tell who is who. But we do know that it will be dealt with. We have got to get right with Jesus today. And don't plan or act like just coming to church or just studying your Bible will make you right with God. It won't. That will not save you. We have to give our lives to Jesus. We have to get right with Him. In Romans chapter 10 it says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised Him from the dead, then we will be saved. That is what saves us. Not works. Not living a good life. But giving and surrendering our life to Jesus. Okay, on to the bold judgment. Verse 15, let's keep going. He says, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having seven last plagues. For in them the wrath of God is complete. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who had the victory over the beast, over his image, and over the mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass... Having harps of God. Let's pause right there for a minute. The wrath of God here is being completed. This word, very interesting, that is used here <clears throat> for wrath. There's two words that are used, and again, Pastor David Guzik really points out something neat here. He says the word for wrath is thumos, which means passion. In anger. Again, I feel like I've given out numerous David Guzik nuggets today, but he was giving out more more nuggets than, um, than, than, than I just had to bring them in. And listen to what he says. He says, The ancient Greek word for wrath is thumos. As was the case in Revelation 14.10, there are two words for wrath or anger in biblical Greek. Thumos and org. This is the place where God's anger flashes hot. The second one, or, is the most common word for God's anger in the New Testament, but thumos is used only 11 times, and 10 of the 11 are in Revelation. It is a book that reveals the judgment of God against a Jesus-rejecting world. Said another way, God is pouring out His wrath. There's no way to filter it. This, this righteous anger is all coming to pass. Another little nugget, and this is a nugget of mine, is it says, having harps of God. I remember reading this verse when we were deciding on Elia's name. And the reason why she got the middle name Harper was, when I read about these harpists, I was like, hold up. These harpists, they're warriors. They are warrior, you know, warrior angels of God. And so we came up with Elia's name, Elia Harper, which means, in our terms, a warrior with a song. Now sometimes people hate on instruments in worship, but here we see that it's being used by God. So why not here at Calvary Chapel Tiffin? And then they sing a song, verse 3. And they sing the song of Moses, the sermon of God, the servant of God, and the, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works. The Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you. For your judgments have been manifested. What an incredible worship song. Notice the, the mix of the Old Testament and the New Testament. You can also notice the emphasis in this worship song. Look at how many times you and yours is used in this worship song. I think it's seven times. This group is focused on God as worship should be. Let's keep going. Verse 5. In these things I looked and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And out of the temple came the seven angels having the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen and having their chests girded with golden bands. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of wrath, the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. The temple was filled with smoke and from the glory of God and from His power. 
and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Out of the temple, judgment comes from heaven. Now these seven angels having seven plagues, if we can remember back, what does seven mean in the Bible? Completeness, right? So this is a complete. It says having on their chest is girded with golden bands. Now if you're looking for an upcoming trend, or if you're one that loves fashion, this is what they'll all be wearing at some point. So you might as well start rocking a golden band around your chest. And it says, when the cloud of glory fills the temple in heaven, no one can enter it. And it was the same when Moses could not enter the, the, the tabernacle, when the smoke of the, cal- the cloud of God's glory. This is sometimes called the Shekinah, which filled the tent. You can look up Exodus chapter 40, but what a scene. What a scene. What a powerful scene this must be. Let's look at these seven bowls. It says, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth. And a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped the image. Yikes. So the first bowl is for a certain group, the ones that had this mark of the beast. And they got these loathsome sores. Verse 3, it says, Then a second angel came and poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man. And every living creature in the sea died. The second bowl that we read about is that the sea turns into blood. Makes you think of an Old Testament time where plagues were coming, doesn't it? It says, Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard an angel of the water saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and was and, and who is to be, because you have judged these things, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. For it is their just due. And I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Isn't that intense? When these bowls of wrath are being poured out, they will still be proclaiming here, God, this is is true. This is righteousness. This is what it looks like. And so at this point, the waters will be turned to blood. It says, Then a fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun. The power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has the power over these plagues. And they did not repent and give him glory. There's lots of predictions on what happened here. Some believe this is an atomic bomb that had been dropped. It also could very well be that those who have believed in global warming were right. This is coming. There's going to come a point where it gets extremely hot. But what you notice here is that you can't stop it. You can't stop what's coming. The fourth bowl is that men are scorched. Isn't it interesting that even as this awful, these awful things are happening, it says that they got more angry. We look on and we go, man, just, just, just repent. When God's pouring this all out, why? Why would you keep going? The same reason that Pharaoh kept going. He was stubborn. God said, fine, if you want to be stubborn, I'll harden you in that. And you, you know, you go back and you read that account and you go, my goodness, with these frogs and these river being turned to blood is these sores if I had frogs in my house like that I would repent right like what, what are you waiting on all this darkness hail they lost livestock and you just go dude like just turn to the Lord and that's the problem people don't want to I'm good I'm a good person it's the same exact thing that is happening here 
It says they blaspheme the name of God because of it. And some people will because become so hardened to God that even when this awful thing is happening, they still won't turn. It says, Then a fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues because of their pain. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their swords, and did not repent of their deeds. The fifth bowl is darkness and pain. What a picture of stubborn brokenness. This is awful to watch, isn't it? We've got two more. It says, verse 12, Then a sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and the water was dried up, so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Yikes, that's kind of gross, right? For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gather them together in the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. The sixth bowl is that the Euphrates River is dried up. Share a nugget from Pastor Sandy Adams. This is how cool this is. He pointed out that in Daniel chapter 11, here in this section in Revelation, another prophecy sees this same event. When the Antichrist invades Israel, he'll be attacked by Syria from the north and Egypt from the south, but to no avail. The only hindrance to the plans of the beast is news of the armies approaching from the east. Is this the Chinese and confederacy of nations? Who knows? All we're told is how they reach the battlefield. They march into the plain of Megiddo through the dried up riverbed. Traditionally, the Euphrates River is the boundary between east and west. It's 1,800 miles long. In places, it's two-thirds of a mile wide, 30 feet deep. This great riverbed literally will become the highway to hell. Here's the road the eastern armies will take to Armageddon. Now listen to this. In 1990, Turkey completed a $1.5 billion dam called the Atatürk of the Euphrates River. This very well could be the way that the Euphrates River is dried up and leads this army into the battle of Armageddon. Isn't that nuts? You know, 400 years ago, they would look on and go, how is this river going to be dried up and how would they march right on through? Turkey comes in and says, well, we're going to build this dam, spend $1.5 billion, and one of the things that we'll be able to do is, you know, get vegetation in these different places. And at some point, didn't you think people had to realize, like, okay, so but would you be able to dry up the Euphrates River? Oh, yeah, I mean, that'll be one of the things that'll... What? Very well could be that this is how it happens. And isn't it kind of interesting that we could be like so close to that happening? That all of the things are in place for this to happen. So this place called Armageddon. The word Armageddon, if you've only heard it from the Bruce Willis movie with uh, Ben Affleck, there's more meaning behind it. Man, I used to love that movie though. Whew. The word Armageddon, is, it has Hebrew origins. Har is the word for mountain. Megiddon is referencing the northern city of Israel, Megiddo. This is where the great armies will assemble on the plains. Megiddo, this again from Sandy Adams. Megiddo is the southern boundary of the valley of Jezreel. It's, it's the site of numerous historic battles from Deborah and Barak to Gideon to Saul to General Allenby in World War I, today there's an Israeli Air Force base in the middle of the valley. Its fighter jets fly between Syria and Iran. When Napoleon Bonaparte saw this expansive plane in the Megiddo, he remarked, all the armies of the world could maneuver for battle here. And one day, they will. Isn't that interesting? 
The ghetto simply serves as a staging area for the armies of the world as they move against Jerusalem. Isn't that wild? This is how that last and final battle will go down. Okay, let's finish up. The seventh bull. It says, Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of, of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake, as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And great hail from heaven fell upon man, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague and the hail, since the plague was exceedingly great. Great, Ruby, if you want to make your way up, we're about to close in song. A couple of interesting things in this section. It says now the great city was divided into three parts. Currently it's in two. It's been quite the talk in the news recently. But at this point it will be divided into three. It says great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. A talent is equal to 100 pounds. That is going to be quite the hail from heaven. It says, Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since the plague was exceedingly great. And you just feel awful. And you know, you go through all of this and you just say, Man, just get right. Just get right. And so that's where we're in today. Next week, chapter 17, as we make our way through the end of the book of Revelation. If there's anything that we can pray for you, make sure not to leave today without praying together. Let's pray, and then Ruby will close us in song. Why don't we stand? Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this time in the book of Revelation. These chapters, Lord, are ones that are a bit terrifying, but they're also ones that are sobering, Lord. I pray for anybody that is not right with you. I pray that they would see your truth and their need for you. I pray that you would reveal to each one how badly they need you. God, I pray for us as a fellowship. Encourage us as a group in your ways. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.